Well, good morning. And uh, hard to believe this is the last chapel of the week, and for uh, a lot of us, our last chapel for the summer. And I just want to say thank you for uh, the privilege of, of letting me share God's Word with you. And I so have enjoyed these last couple of weeks. And I would love to stay in touch with you if you're heading home. Uh, connect with me online, Instagram. I know a few of you might still use Facebook. It's mostly for old people. But I know a few of you use it. Uh, but you can just find me on there, Pastor Dan Davis. It's pretty easy to find. I uh, had to use that because there's about 1.3 million Dan Davises in the United States. So we're a pretty, pretty common species. But... Um, Speaking of common species, uh, if you follow me on there, I, I try to put some scripture up usually every day or some encouraging thoughts, so to do that I also got to update you on our family or sometimes what I'm eating and occasionally I take selfies with animals. And uh, this is an emu, so uh, just to wake you up a little bit on a Friday morning, uh, he was willing to pose for a selfie. Uh, I captured him on the way to camp down in uh, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. So let's begin with a thought this morning. It takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast as that. Name that movie. Anybody know the movie that comes from? Forrest Gump is incorrect. The Green Mile? No, it actually comes from Alice in Wonderland. All right, so going back a little ways, I thought some of you might know that, but evidently not. But we can sort of identify with a the thought there, right? Life goes by quickly. And, you know, how many of you would say these last week or these last two weeks you've been here have gone by really fast, right? We wait all year to get here, right? And it just goes by so fast. Life goes by quickly. The older that you get, the more that you will realize the brevity of life. Life goes by quickly. And, and I don't say that this morning to discourage us or to depress us because ultimately we have the great hope in Jesus, right, that we are possessors of his, what, eternal life. And that, that our time here on earth may be brief, right, we get to live forever with Jesus in his presence, in his glory, in heaven, in a new earth, a new creation one day. But in that time between now and and then what God has called us to seek Him and to know Him. And we've been in the book of Ephesians these, la Ephesians these last two weeks looking at the incredible riches that we have in Christ and what Jesus has done for us and how He's chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world and He's offered us grace through Jesus and He's offered us eternal life and He's, he's saved us and He's made us His children. He's made us His masterpiece. We began this week looking at Paul's prayer that we would understand the, the depth and the height and the width of God's love for us. And we've been looking then at Ephesians 4 and following where, where Paul says, what, I challenge you to walk worthy of this calling that you've been called. I've challenged you to, to use this life for God's glory. And we've been looking at how we do that. And this morning, as we wrap up, I want us to think about how, for how we live this out. How do, how do we live out this incredible salvation? How do we live out this life? And uh, as we think about that, I would think about the brevity of our life. James says, for you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. And so this morning I want us to think about how do we make the most of our mist, right? How do we make the most of this precious time that God's granted? And we don't know the length of that time, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is what do we do with this time that God has given us? Our word for today is influence. Influence. I want us to think about what influence it's going to take for us to live out this life that God's called us to live. And so if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians 5 and uh, verses 15 through 21. Ephesians 5 verses 15 through 21. Let's begin uh, with the first uh, three verses. Ephesians 5 says, So be careful how you live, not as fools, but as those who are wise. Make the most of every opportunity for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. Now, how many of you have a parent or a mom, somebody who has told you over and over again to be careful? Anybody? All right. My mom still tells me to be careful, all right? I'm 40 years old. Oops, did I say that out loud? Um, 
My mom was, you know, she, before I came here, she says, be careful. If you, are you going to play Frisbee again? You know, she, you know, moms never stop worrying about us, right? Moms want us to be careful and to be safe. But here, Paul says, be careful, be careful how you live. Right? And, and this should be sort of an attention grabber for us, right? Paul's writing to this church, he says, be careful, be aware, pay attention, is what he's saying. Pay attention to how you live. Right? And then he says, what? Not as what? Somebody say it out loud. Fools. Right? Nobody wants to be a fool. Right? Nobody wants to be a fool. But Paul is saying there's a risk that we could act foolishly and miss what God has for us in this life. That we could still belong to Him and yes, be His child and yes, be on our way to heaven and yes, spend eternity with Him and how glorious that will be. But he says there is a possibility that we might miss what God wants to do in us and through us in this life. And so he warns them, he says, be careful, pay attention, don't be a fool. But he says, rather be wise. This word fool that Paul uses, it really has the idea, it's not just, uh, it's not just being ignorant or, or, or not smart. It, it has the idea of leaving God out of the equation. Leaving God out of the equation. So Paul's saying, we're going to be foolish if we try to live life without God being in the equation. And we all could sit here and agree, I agree with that, I should do that, I get that, that's right. But if we were honest this morning, how many times practically in life do we leave God out of the equation? We don't fully trust Him and put Him in our life. And so he says, be wise. Then he says, make the most of every opportunity. Redeem the time. Buy back the time. You know, he started this book by saying we've been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We are bought by Him, purchased by Him. We belong to Him. Now he says, buy back the time. Take the opportunities that you have. And he says, use them for doing good in these evil days. Don't act thoughtlessly, but try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. Make the most of your time. Our time is limited, our time is brief, and life goes by fast. And so Paul wanted the believers in Ephesus, and he would want us today to say, realize your time is precious. Realize it's valuable. Use it wisely. So how do we do that? Well, in our culture today, we are sort of addicted to busyness, right? Do this, do that, go there, be here, right? And we are busy, busy people. But I don't think Paul was suggesting that we just get busier, right? That we frantically try to fill our time up with as many things as possible, right? That's not what he's saying. He's saying step back and be wise about your time. Understand, he says, try to understand what the Lord wants you to do. Right? We looked at Ephesians 2.10. You're God's masterpiece. He's, you're his special creation, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should what? Walk in them. So he says, try to figure out what is it that God wants me to do? Well, how? How do we do that? How do we redeem the time? How do we not be fools? How do we be careful? How do we pay attention? Well, Paul's going to show us what we need to do. Right? Because it's not about our effort. Look at the next verse. Verse 18. Paul says, Don't be drunk with wine, because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill you and control you. Right? So Paul's going to use the example of, of, of intoxication right, to help us understand a really important spiritual truth. And, and while he's there, he does remind us that, that God does not want us to live our lives under influences that can control us other than his spirit, right? So he says, don't be drunk, don't, don't live under the influence of alcohol, but it's also not just a warning, but it's also an illustration, right? And so Paul's clearly saying, as followers of Christ, we should not be drunk, right? We shouldn't live under the influence of alcohol, we shouldn't live under the influence of drugs or things like that, and, and listen, those are real temptations and real challenges that you will face, right? And, and there, there's sometimes great pressure to say, I need an escape, I need an out, Right? But God wants you to realize His grace is sufficient right? and not to seek those things. But He wants us to understand that there's a picture here. right? Because when someone is intoxicated, right, do they talk the same as they usually talk? Help me out here. No. Do they walk the same way that they usually walk? No. Do they don't act the same way they usually act? 
right? Because the alcohol in their system has changed their behavior. It's changed their thinking, it's changed their talking, it's changed their attitudes, it's changed their actions. Right? And so he says, just as someone can come under the influence of alcohol, he says, look, he says, what? Let the Holy Spirit fill you and control you. Right? And, and so Paul wanted the believers there to know that you can't live the Christian life in your own strength and in your own power. Right? We, we can't live the life God's called us to live in our own strength. We can't do it. And if we go home from here and we try to live out the things that God's taught us while we're here, if we try to put those into practice and we try to do it ourselves, if we try to do it in our own strength, we'll fail every single time. Right? I, I appreciated that, that testimony last night that, and when we sang about God's incredible grace. Aren't you grateful for God's grace? Right? There's not any one of us that, that can live out this life perfectly. That's not the point. But the point is that we have to do it under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his followers the night before he went to the cross. Right? And he was trying to prepare them that he would soon be leaving them. Right? They had been with him for three years, day and night. And now he was leaving them and, and he wanted to prepare them. He says, I'm going away. But he says, if I go, I'm going to send the helper, the Holy Spirit. And he's going to actually live in you. And he said to his disciples, it's to your advantage. It's to your advantage that I go. Because the Holy Spirit will come. What was Jesus saying? He says, as good as it's been for me to be right here beside you, that God in you is better than God beside you. The Holy Spirit of God lives in you if you know Jesus as your Savior. And he'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He'll never forsake you in the worst of times, in the most hard times things that you go through in, in the, your own failures, right? He'll never leave you. He'll never abandon you. He'll never give you up, give up on you. But he also wants you to understand that you and I need to access his power, right? Influence is the capacity to have effect on the character, the development or behavior of someone or something. And God wants our lives to come under his influence. And he does that through the Holy Spirit, right? And we we are His. Uh, I shared this verse with you the other day, but 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Paul says, Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Right? That's an extraordinary thought. Right? That, that my life isn't my own anymore. Right? I've been bought by the blood of Christ. My life belongs to Him. And not only that, but in, in a way I have become a temple right? where the Holy Spirit lives in me. This was, a, this was an extraordinary thought that Paul was sharing with the church. Right? Because up until Jesus came, right, the, the temple was the place where heaven and earth intersected. It was where God's presence came down. Right? And, and only one day of of the year, one person could go into the very innermost part of the temple, into the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was most fully known. And, and he would go there to make atonement for, for the people and, and to bring their sin to God on their behalf and, and to confess. And, and, and it was a powerful moment. But now, because of Jesus, because of the cross, right, the veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom. And now we have access to God, but now His Spirit dwells in us. And we have access to God. We have become temples, a place where heaven and earth intersects. Right? That, that God wants your life to be a place where His glory and His Spirit and His power intersect earth. Right? You're, you are on this earth for a purpose. Right? You're to bring glory to God. You're to use the talents and the gifts and the abilities that He's given you to serve Him and to serve this world and to bring people to Jesus and to fulfill the purpose that God has for you. But we can't do that unless we access the power of the Holy Spirit. Right? Unless we live under His influence. Listen, God wants His influence, His Spirit to affect our thinking, our talking, our actions, our attitudes. Right? That's the only way that we'll be able to live out this incredible call on God's life. Right? God wants to transform us from the inside out. As I've said earlier this week, Christianity is not a behavior modification program. It's not about a list of rules and regulations that you follow and then God's pleased with you. No, God saved you. You're His. You're His child. He's put His Spirit in you and He wants you through the power of the Spirit in a relationship of love to live a life that's faithful to Him, to walk worthy, 
Right? Remember Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, walk worthy. Live a life equal to the weight of your calling. But we can't do that. You know, if ch- ch- we talked about imitating God yesterday, right? We can't imitate God. We can't be imitators of God. We can't walk worthy without the power of the Holy Spirit. So we have to allow the Spirit to fill us and control us. Now listen, just like, you know, someone can come under the influence of alcohol, but it's a temporary effect. It wears off after a while. It takes repeated fillings to stay under the influence. and It's the same way with the Holy Spirit. Listen, we don't need more of the Holy Spirit. right? He lives in us. right? We don't get more of Him. But we need to submit and to surrender to Him to come under His influence. We have to choose that. right? Because we can ignore His presence in our life. We can not submit ourselves to His Spirit. And so it takes a daily surrender. I wish... I wish all of us this morning could just decide, I want to be filled with the Spirit for the rest of my life. Wouldn't that be great? That I want to be Spirit-filled and under control of the Spirit, and I want to reflect Jesus, and I want to live for Him. I wish we could all just decide that this morning, but we can't. Now, we can decide that we want to do that, or we'd like to do that, but it takes daily walking with Christ, daily spending time with Him, daily time in His Word, daily time in prayer, daily time in fellowship with other believers. Right? It takes... Time surrendering, saying, God, I want to submit my life to your spirit, to your ways. And remember, Paul's sharing all of this with that warning. Be careful, right? Pay attention. Don't miss this. Don't be a fool. Don't waste your life, right? I don't want to see any of you waste the precious life that God's given you. All of you are smart. You're talented. You are gifted by God. You're His precious children. And I believe that God wants to use your lives in incredible ways for His glory and for His kingdom. He has things for you to do that no one else can do. And He wants you to fulfill that purpose. But you and I need to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit if we're going to do that. What happens when we live under the influence of the Holy Spirit? What does it look like? Well, Paul shares three things. Number one, he says you'll have a new song in your heart. When the whole, you know, so we say, how do I know if I'm living under the influence? What does it look like? Well, he says in verse 19, Then you will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, making music to the Lord in your hearts. I don't have to tell any of you that music is powerful. Right? Music is so powerful. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift that God's given us. Right? And we, it has a way of, of affecting our, our hearts and our minds and our spirits like few other things. It, it has a way of, we can memorize music like few other things. You know, it's often, when we're going through difficult times, it's often a hymn or a song that God uses, right? Because we remember those. You won't remember many of my sermons, right? But you'll remember the songs that you sing, right? Music is powerful. So he says, when the Holy Spirit fills our life, he says, you'll naturally want to sing, Right, you'll naturally, he says, you'll have music in your heart. And so a sure sign, you say, how do I know if, if the Spirit of God is filling my life? Do you have a song in your heart? Do you feel in your heart just a desire to praise God, to worship Him, to express your love for Him? Right? He loves to hear His children sing. He loves to hear His children express their praise through music, through their gifts and your talents. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit who, de- who brings that desire to us. And so a sure sign of the Spirit filling our life, right, is when we have songs in our heart, when we desire to praise God. Then he says, you'll have an attitude of gratitude. It's pretty interesting. He says, one of the things that shows that the Spirit of God is filling our hearts and our lives is that we will be grateful people, that we will be humble and thankful people. He says in verse 20, And you will always give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of God of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have a grateful heart. Right? When when you're filled with the Spirit, you'll have a profound sense of of the worthiness of God and your own unworthiness. And yet, He has chosen, right, to lavish His love and His grace and His mercy on you. There'll be a genuine humility. How do we we give thanks in everything or for everything? It's when we realize that, that everything... In every situation in our life, whether it's good or bad, God is there with us. And we can trust Him. So he says, we'll have an attitude of thankfulness. He says, you will always give thanks when you're filled with the Spirit in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then, number three, he says, you will put others first. So he says, you'll have a song in your heart, 
You'll have gratitude in your heart, but he says, then you'll put others first. Look at verse 21. He says, and further, you will submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. You see, God calls us to live out this Christian life in community, in relationship with one another. The, the Christian life is not a solo sport. Right? We, we're to live in community with one another. It's what we call the church, the body of Christ. We're to, we're to gather with God's people right? and, and share life with them. And l Listen, God doesn't want our gathering just to be a Sunday morning thing right? where we get together and, and, and come together for an hour and then go back out and, and don't see each other for a week. That's not really the picture there. It's one of the reasons why this place is so special. Right? It's because we get to experience what the church is. Eating together, working together, Performing together, playing together, serving together, right? We, we get to experience what life together is like. And so he says, when we are filled with the Spirit, he says, we'll have a desire to put others first. You know, we are by nature selfish people, right? How many of you say, I tend to look out for number one? Anybody? Who's number one? You are, right? I thought I was. Wait, right? We, we all tend to do that to some degree, more than others. But he says, when the Spirit fills our life, when the Holy Spirit controls us, that we'll want to put others first. And I think about the way that Jesus modeled this for us. Right? He was the God of the universe come in human flesh. Jesus, when he walked on the earth, was fully God, but he was fully man. But he humbled himself. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, and he became a man and he lived among us. But one of the most extraordinary things that Jesus did that shows his willingness to serve others was the night before the cross. Right, the night before the cross, the Bible says that Jesus did this, that he washed the disciples' feet. Right, and, and that was a task that was reserved for the lowest slave in a household, the lowest servant. But what happened that night were, was that the Passover meal had been prepared and placed in an upper room and Jesus and his disciples gathered there. But the problem was there was no servant there. And so when they walked in that room that night, no one washed feet. Now you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, they lived and traveled in a culture where they, the roads were dusty and dirty and they wore sandals, right? And their feet were hot and sweaty and dirty. And you have to also understand that the tables that they, that they ate at they reclined around like this, right? So they would eat at a low table, reclined. Now, if you're eating like this, what's right next to your face? Feet, right? Nasty, smelly, dirty. Can you imagine Peter's feet, right? Or you think your feet are bad. No one washed feet that night, and you know why? Because I'm sure everyone thought that someone else should wash feet, right? Peter was probably like, man, dude, I'm the leader of the group. I don't wash feet. James and John were like, we're the sons of thunder. We don't wash feet, right? Maybe James the less should wash feet, right? But even James the less didn't want to wash feet. So in the middle of the meal, Jesus gets up and he goes over to the corner of the room where the basin and the towels were. Now, you have to imagine, I'm sure that they all looked over in the corner of the room and they went in. They all knew that someone should wash feet, but nobody wanted to do it. And then Jesus wraps a towel around his waist and he brings the basin over and he starts washing their feet. Can you imagine how silent it was in that room? And everyone knew, like, this, he shouldn't be doing it. Jesus shouldn't be washing feet, but he did. He served them in the most menial of tasks, right? And, and think about the feet that he washed that night, All right? He, he washed James and John's feet, right? James and John were the ones who were that very week trying to argue for top positions in Jesus' coming administration, right? They're like, and they even got their mom in on it, right? They got their mom to go to Jesus and say, hey, would it be cool if like they sat at your left hand and your right hand in, in your kingdom? Can they be like vice president and secretary of state? Right? And some people use Jesus to advance themselves. But Jesus washed their feet. Thomas would doubt his resurrection, but he washed Thomas' feet. Peter, that very night, would deny that he even knew who Jesus was with cursing and swearing. But Jesus washed his feet. But not only that, Jesus washed Judas' feet. 
the one who would betray him. He could have dismissed him before that. But he washed the, even the feet of his betrayer, the one who sold him out, the one who was pretending and faking. But Jesus washed his feet. And, and, and of course, you remember Peter sort of resisted and he wanted a bath and all that, right? But after they got done, Jesus finishes washing feet and he says, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. For very truly I tell you that no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Jesus says, do as I have done for you. Now in our culture today, I don't think that means we literally have to wash each other's feet, but it means we need to be willing to serve one another. We need to be willing to put others ahead of ourselves. We need to see others as more important than ourselves. And this is what happens when we're filled with the Spirit of God. Paul says in Philippians 2, Don't do anything from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than, count others as more significant than yourself. Right? But just picture Jesus today. Picture Him washing your feet. Because He would have if you had been there. And then picture Him saying to you, Do as I have done for you. My desire for you is that you would take this incredible life that God's given you, this beautiful life and the beautiful reality of the gospel, and that you would live out the call of God on your life through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do it ourselves. We can't do it, but God does it in us and through us. And so I want to challenge you to live under the influence, not of alcohol or drugs or the world's values or the culture's values, but to live under the influence of the Holy Spirit by realizing every day how desperately dependent you are upon Him, to realize every morning, God, I need you to fill me. I need you to control me. I need you to, to consume me. And so I want to fill my mind with your truth. Right? I, I want to fill my mind with truth. I want to, to, I want to make sure that I'm spending time with my Father in heaven in prayer. I, I want to ask Him to fill me and to consume me and to control me so that I can live out this glorious life. God wants to use your life in a great way for His glory. And it will only happen when we live under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And so I want to challenge you today to make the most of your mist. Right? Make the most of your mist. Your life is a vapor. It appears for a short time and passes away. And I don't want you to miss what God has for you. Live a life filled with the Spirit. Live a life of worship with songs in your heart. Live with an attitude of thankfulness and live with an attitude of service. And you won't miss what God has for you. Let me pray over you this morning. Father in heaven, we, we, we bow our hearts and our lives before you this morning. And Father, we are so grateful that you gave us your spirit. That you haven't left us alone in this life. And Father, so many times in life we feel lonely. We, we feel distant. But Father, I thank you that no matter what we feel, that you have promised that your Spirit is within us. And Father, I pray that, that as, as many of us leave here in a couple of days, and, and all of us, whether it's a week or two, will be heading back to our, our lives at home and all of the challenges and difficulties that await us there, as well as the opportunities that await us there. Father, I pray that we would leave dependent on your Spirit to fill us and to control us. And Father, I pray for every one of our students, our counselors, our staff, our faculty. Father, I pray that they might live lives filled with your Spirit, that they would live under the influence. And Father, I pray that, that they would live lives of service to you and your kingdom. I pray, Father, that they would, by the power of the Spirit, follow the example of Jesus. They would be imitators of God as they follow Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would use their lives in, gr in a great way for your glory and for your kingdom. Use them to point many to you. Use them for the purpose for which you've created them. Father, that you might be glorified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.